Hi, this is Lincoln Goins, and you're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome to ForBassPlayersOnly.com, where old rockers learn to groove. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman, and I'm really excited about this week's interview. I've interviewed him a couple times before. Good friend of mine, Lincoln Goins, who's played with everyone from Dave Valentine to Mike Stern, Sonny Rollins, Michael Brecker, Carly Simon, Tanya Maria, Dizzy Gillespie, Bob Mincer, Michelle Camilo, on and on, Paquito de Rivera, Eliani Alias, and he's a faculty member at Berkeley College of Music, and he was or still is uh, on the faculty at uh, City College of New York. Hello, Lincoln. Welcome back to ForBassPlayersOnly.com. Hi, John. Always good to see you. Thank you. You too. Yeah. Uh, Thanks was, for having uh, me here. Thank you for coming. There was about a seven-year gap, I think, between our first interview and our second interview, and uh, that last one was three years ago. That was three I, years in the summertime, right? In right. Summertime up at the college up in Boston. Yeah. Right. That was fun. And uh, well, the reason I reached out to you this time is because uh, you've got a very cool new record. I love it. I've been listening to it. It's called The Art of the Bass Choir. With yes. Thank you, sir. Some of my other favorite bass players like, oh, Tom Kennedy, John Patitucci, Victor Wooten, Mike Pope, Matthew Garrison, and a couple of not bad drummers, too, like Dennis Chambers and uh, and Robbie Amin. So I assume you want to talk about the record. So let's start there. Well, it started, you know, I mean, I can I can go into to the detail of, of the of the particulars of how this came together. And it was a very long process. Because I can remember uh, some specific incidences that inspired me, you know, uh, not that I not that I acted on it right away, but there was um, I'm not you probably know you probably know this there was there was a there was a bass choir in New York, led by Bill Lee. Yes, Bill Lee is Spike Lee's dad. And he's right. still around. He's almost 100 years old. This guy. I don't know if he plays anymore. There's but another he, Bill Lee who's Will Lee's dad, but that's not the same person. No, no, this is Bill Lee, Spike Lee's dad, upright bass player. Yep. He did a he had he put out a couple of projects and he did some he did some video footage Which and I actually saw it on TV. Really? It was in TV. It was the New York Bass Violin Choir and check out who was in this choir. It was it was it was uh, Ron Carter, yep. uh Richard Davis, Milt Hinton, Sam Jones. Yeah. I'm not joking. I All these guys were playing with Bill Lee and it was beautiful. It was it was it, it, it moved me so deeply. I was already, you know, the spirit of the bass had already possessed me at that point in my career. This is probably late 70s or early 80s. I'm just uh, relocating to New York and I saw it on the television. I didn't have a chance to see it live, but man, it was just so inspirational to see what they were doing. And it was it was all basses and it was in that frequency and it had that perfect imperfect uh uh temperament that was free of the of the of the restrictions of the keyboard in terms of the way it was pitched it was unique and, and and it moved me that was one thing that that really inspired me the other thing that inspired me was working with steve swallow and talking to him and seeing him play uh you know the argument could be made tell me if i'm wrong john you probably know more about this than i do but he was the first basis that i saw doing uh using extended range instruments um really? yeah high high c string uh and playing uh without getting into a guitaristic sort of uh vocabulary he was playing upper register chordal stuff because you know he's a he's a brilliant writer and pianist and everything and, and um i asked him about you know how we did it and what he was doing to voice certain things and the sonority of the bass now, I don't think that I could have done this record, and you heard the record, I don't think I could have done this record with, for example, all Fender basses, because it would just be too, um, would be too dense, uh, and it would be too, too thick of a sound. So when you say Fender, Fender, you mean, you mean electric bass? You don't? Yeah, no, electric bass, the Fender bass. <laughs> You're yeah, an old member like me. You play Fender bass too? <laughs> I used to play Fender bass. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I by the way, go, I, I think Rufus Reed was part of that bass choir too. I have a CD somewhere. Uh, yeah, you could be right about that, but I'm not 100 percent sure, you know. But but that's that, that's a good guess though. There were some other names that were less um, recognizable, at least to me, that, that that he had in that choir, and he had some singing and some yeah. some uh, you know sort of uh, semi political sort of statements. It's um, not for everyone. It's an acquired liking. It's it's for bass players and other. Yeah, people. yeah. I I I and and so when I when I started teaching at Berkeley, this is this is a more going coming to the present time. When I started teaching at Berkeley, I'm, I don't remember. I think it was two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Uh, I got a professorship up there, and uh, and there were some upper semester students I was working with who who could play pretty well. And I went, wow, this is an opportunity for me to to try out some of these things that I started to score out uh, by myself and also in collaboration with um, uh, mostly with some people, mostly with Klaus Mueller, my, my pianist friend who I would throw uh, things back and forth with and we'd work out voicings and things like that. And one thing led to another and a few years went by and I realized that I had about 25 tunes, 25 arrangements in different genres um, that all featured the bass what I, what I, what in, tunes that inspired me, some of the stuff I wrote myself, original stuff, and I had a, a choice of selecting tunes, and I went, wow, this is a lot of stuff. And COVID came up, and you know, the home studio thing came up, and I started throwing things back and forth with people, and I said, I'm going to get some of the cats to play on this, and 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 I'm going to put together, you know, something of of as high integrity as I possibly could, and feature the the pieces that I. That, that moved me the most that I thought were the most successful in terms of presenting the bass and telling a story and showcasing the diversity of the instrument in this in this context. And, you know, I have to say, you know, I don't really, I don't really like to boast too much about what I'm able to do. But I think that one of the things that I'm able to do well is to play a lot of different styles at a, at a fairly high level. So, you know, there's some classical stuff on there, there's some Latin stuff on there. There's some original music. There's some experimental stuff. There's some funk stuff that I'm doing with Dennis and, and Victor Wooten, which is Victor. I mean, I tell you, I, I could talk about what he did with it. And everybody was absolutely thrilled to participate in this project. I wanted to ask one of the questions, and you may have answered it, but maybe not completely. I wanted to know if you had the music and then you selected the players to see who's going to be best for each piece, or if you had some players in mind that you wanted to include and came up with the music that way that would suit them? I would say it was the former. It was, it was in most cases, it was the former. In some cases, it was building things on the moment. There's a, there's a tune I did with Matt Garrison where we threw things back and forth. It's called Spin the Floor. It's an original. Yeah. It's very sort of weird, sort of, I don't know, weird, but, but, but very challenging sort of a pretzel thing in nine with a lot of multi-layers on it. And that was something that I constructed in the moment. And then Matt, you know, gave me some things and threw a couple of things back at me. And I said, yeah, this is great. I mean, I wasn't going to say, I didn't really give him any suggestions other than I knew he was going to play the hell out of it because it's based on the three-tone row giant steps. Yes. And, uh, and, and Robbie Amin plays on it. He complained a little bit because he didn't want to play a 9-8 clave. I said, come on, if anybody in the world can do this, man, come on. Yeah. You know, Robbie Amin, he's like an animal that you just kind of let out of the cage and he can play whatever he wants. And, your old partner in crime. Funk My old partner in crime on the Funkifying the Clave. Yes, indeed. Yes. Yeah, we go way back. What is with Adam Nussbaum doing a rap about Jocko? How did How that about that? How about that? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and there are some uh, some bass players, uh, two former students of mine who are operating at a pretty high level now, Ksenia Vasileva, yes. who was uh, living in New York. Now she's living in New York. She's playing. She helped me with a lot of the uh, the basic tracking. From Russia. And, and so. She's Russian, yeah. She's Russian. She's from Saint Petersburg, uh, and uh, and Mike Bendy, who's the Federa um, yes. uh, head of sales over at Federa, who shreds the hell out of the bass. He's got a six string Federa, and I wanted him to. And he, and he actually lived with the Pastorius family, and Ooh. he's a real jockophile. Yeah, and he um, jockophile. I like that. Yeah, <laughs> and he was thrilled to be able to 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 play on the uh, on the. On the tune we're talking about now, Liberty City. Nussbaum used to play with Jocko back in the day before things sort of went left with, with Jocko at the, towards the end of his life. Uh, Nussbaum was one of the regular drummers who would play with Jocko. 
and who could handle Jocko, <laughs> you know? And Jocko dug him. And he's got this thing that he does, this rap kind of thing. It's kind of like Jackie Mason meets Elvin Jones. I don't know what, how else to explain. He's a unique character. You know, he, he, he is a one of a kind. And I was talking to Mike Bendy about it and said, and he said, why don't you get Adam to do like an interpretation rap thing on this? And I thought about it and I went, oh, you know, let's, let's see what happens. So I sent him the sort of almost finished product and he wrapped into a phone and did all these raps and I clipped it all together and I told my engineer, Dean Albach, I said, Dean, what can you do with this? You know, you know, I'm not going to get a good microphone. I'm not going to get a high quality mic on it. You're going to have to process it to make it. And he said, yeah, I can make it work. And there was a lot of extra work for him, but it, it ended up being like sort of like a potpourri party kind of track. Some people listen to it and they go, ah, what, what, what'd you put that on there for? Some people say, this is awesome. This is, you know, so, but that's, that's the way it is. You know, I, I, what is your impression of it? What do you think? Did you like it? Or? I thought it was fun. I was looking to see if he was playing any drums anywhere. On he there. wasn't playing any drums. That's Robbie. Okay. That's what I mean. Adam is one of my favorite drummers. I've seen him. Oh, he's an awesome drummer. Mike Stern. I've seen him with uh, Michael Brecker. And what was the, the little place that Mike Stern played? The 55 Club? The 55, but that's the place I'm talking about. He used to play with Jocko. Yeah. That's where Adam used to play with Jocko back in the day. Place. I saw that with uh, uh, Jeff Andrews. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Yep. Jeff and Jocko used to play together down there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got to know Jocko because I lived in Florida for six uh -huh. years. Okay, so you know, you know the deal, you know. Yeah. So listen, he's a, you know, he 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 wasn't my favorite person, but he certainly was uh, 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 a phenomenal player and a phenomenal writer. And those two tunes that I put on there, uh, Three Views of a Secret" yeah. and "Liberty City," are two of my favorite pieces of his. I think uh, I think Three Views of a Secret" is a masterpiece yes. uh, in the style of Mingus, in the tradition of of the bass player writing you know it's like fallen grace or or goodbye pork by hat it's like on that level to me i never thought about it that way but yeah absolutely yeah. yeah and and i did it in the original keys i think uh liberty city was also in the original key a little bit dark some of the other things i did on this record i changed the keys to suit the sonority of the bass that makes sense all blues the miles thing that's the original key that's g right yeah well some that's the, the first thing that got my attention because you do that in five and that's the yeah. how, how the whole album starts. I'm like, whoa, what is that? I don't know. I mean, it, 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 it's got a mood to it, and it's Miles, and it's like, uh, it, so you and I, you know, we listen to it, and we know it's in five, but the lay person is going to listen to it, and they go, gee, that sounds nice, and they're not going to necessarily going to be able to discern whether what, what the meter is. Yeah. But I thought it was, it ended up being, it, it ended up being a pretty smooth track, and Tom, uh, takes a second solo on there after my solo, and he, of course, shreds the hell out of it. And, and Ben Porowski, who I used to play with, with with Mike Stern, he plays the drums on it, and he's got this thing on five that nobody has. He used to have a band with, um, who was the guitar player now? He was playing with Steely Dan. He was playing with Patatucci, too. Uh, Adam. Uh, yeah, I know who you mean. Yeah, I'm, you know, here I am forgetting last names again, like I did in the last interview. Oh, oh, by the way, let me interject right now. We yes. were I thought of you about a year ago. There okay. was a player that I interviewed. You said, Who oh, is that guy? He played on Bitches Brew. I yeah, can't Harvey's remember. Harvey Brooks. Harvey, Harvey Brooks. Brooks. I, interviewed I did mention Harvey. him in the interview. I yeah, didn't I it came I was up I think you've probably been thinking the whole time I was talking, who is it? Who is it? And then you just blurted out almost at the end of the interview. Harvey Brooks, that's who yeah. I was I so thrilled that my mind is not completely like a senior citizenized. At this point, <laughs> I interviewed Harvey about a year ago. It was oh, crazy. awesome! Uh, awesome. Jim Hendrix and Bob Dylan and Seals and Crofts. And oh yeah, he has done so much stuff. Yeah, uh, real but, underrated cat. Yeah, so I thought of you. I'm glad you you brought that up. I wanted to mention that too. He lives in Israel. Wow. Yeah. Really. He's been there for a long time. Okay. Okay get back to america once in a while he says for weddings and bar mitzvahs and stuff that's right. okay okay um would you care to comment on the cover of the album lincoln well it's like a, a the vitruvian bassist it's leonardo the bassist so i always thought it would be cool to uh 
to do something in in that you know and maybe it was a little risque i mean mika my wife she took the picture and then john bishop over at origin records very tastefully covered uh you know the the pertinent cracks with with, with letters <laughs> And it was at the end of the summer, like uh, not, was it last summer? No, it was the summer before that when I'd been going to the boxing gym three days a week and I was going to my Tai Chi classes all the time. And I was in pretty good shape, you know, for, for an old man. So I figured that I would do something that, I mean, I, I, it, that's another thing. It, people either love the cover or they go, what, what are you doing? You know, like, but, um, you know, so what? I mean, it's just, it, it, it's a... It draws you in, you know. It's a selling point, I guess, in a way. <laughs> I, just I mean, what do you think? Do you like it? Or... <laughs> I, I like it. Don't don't get me wrong. You know, I I like it in an artistic way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. <laughs> it turned me on looking at you. Anyway. <laughs> no. 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 I'm t so you understand? You know. You know the Vitruvian man, right? You know the. Yeah. Well. Da Vinci. Uh, I, I I love the record now. Now that the record is behind you, and it's really it was released. What was it? October twenty first of twenty. Yeah, yeah, last month on the twenty first. So it's really only been about three weeks now, and things are just starting to come in. Like you know, you asking for an interview, and people putting it on, you know, putting uh, airing on the radio, and uh, you know, s some other uh, you know some other the base uh, outlets, you know, showing interest and stuff like that. What's keeping you busy now that the record is out? What else is uh, you, you got to be working on something? Well, the, uh, you know, the semester up at Berkeley is in full swing and that, that takes up half my week. So I'm, I'm committed to doing that. I'm thinking about some other things that I want to do, uh, in terms of projects, probably something experimental that would not just necessarily be just base, uh, uh you know, base specific. Uh, I'm not sure what that would be, but I did. I did like the way some of the tracks came out that I I did experimental things on. There's the one track that called the the Weaver, where I put some um, some atmospheric stuff in the beginning, and I had Ksenia put uh, some some tone generated uh, Moog synthesizer patch stuff on there, and, and my daughter did some uh, played some cello and uh, and a uh, uh, iPhone triggered radio where she plays to a radio. She's she's a, a She's a performance experimental performance artist based out of Chicago, actually. Nice. Um, and she put some stuff on there for me too. And I, I liked the way that came out. And I thought maybe I would try to do a whole record based on that sort of concept. Well, that's great. Keep us posted, and we will tell everybody about yeah. it. And Meg, it, it'll be even weirder than than this one is. <laughs> I, I, I guarantee mean, it. There's a lot of toe tapping and a lot of head bobbing on this record. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to I wanted to feature the diversity uh, of the instrument in different settings and different genres, and I wanted to sort of tell a story, and also um, uh, make music that that the layperson could enjoy. Somebody who's not a bass player who can listen and go, "Wow, this is this is uh, nicely crafted," and uh, um, and at the same time, I wanted to feature all the aspects of the bass. You know the, the the virtuosity and the sonority and the, and the and the lyricism and 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 all the different colors that you can get out of out of the bass. Um, I there's one track on there that's all uh, uh, arco bass. Oh, I wanted Susan to do more. Hagen. Susan Hagen, yeah, she's, she's uh, a classical double bass faculty member. Classical or? classical double bass faculty. She plays in the uh, the Boston. She's principal in the Boston Pops Orchestra up there in Boston. She plays awesome. She's got the upper register of doom. So I wanted her to play like the first uh, and second bass on this very, very high arco yes. uh, part that I put together. It's a, it's a, it's a quintet transcription of a Johan Johansson uh, uh, piece that I, that I liked in particular called Orphic Hymn. Yeah. Two of those, two of his pieces put together sure. as a, as sort of a medley there in the middle of the, of the album. Tell me a little bit more about your gear. You mentioned Fodera a couple times. You're yeah. Pretty much exclusively a Fodera guy? I would say so, yeah, at this point. I mean, you know, my acoustic bass is a is an Italian bass that was uh, refurbished for me by by uh, Bill Merchant and Zach Lane. Um, they haven't been able to put an exact date on it, but it's probably like 1870, something like that. And the, the Fodera is five-string? Yeah, these are five string basses. I actually have three of them. 
this one is a 33 inch koa body um, single pickup voiced a little bit sort of like in a gary willis sort of register um, the other one i have is a little bit closer to the to the neck more like in the anthony jackson range actually vinnie federa he voiced these pickups for me before he routed the cavity uh, we moved the pickup up and down to get like the most optimal B string sound. You know, it's got that piano thing going on. Yeah. This is a short scale bass. It's very, you know, not. I know I just made some distortion there. That was not good. There we go. The other one that I got in the case right now is um, is passive, and it's also Koa body. I also have uh, an oak body, oak neck, oak walnut body fretless that's 33 that i used on the record as well so i have three baderas here in the house three that are that strings. are mine they're all five strings so i did most of the layering on the record some of the stuff i i, I sourced out to some of the other players mike pope plays bass one on, on a couple of tracks you know he's awesome he's such a virtuoso and 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 patatucci uh I, I had I had him playing uh you know some melodies and, and some parts on on the tune that he plays on which is Bello Piano the Dori Kaimi tune. We touched on this, but I, I want to go a little deeper. We, we okay. Have, at for bass players only, we're an instruction site. We get people from all over the world every day coming to for bass players only to learn. Uh -huh. Yeah. Most of them are men in their fifties, sixties, seventies. I mentioned old rockers. That's most of them are but a lot of them are jazz fans and that's why there'd be a great interest in, in this sure. record in you, sure. and in you do but a lot of times when you get to be 50 60 70 you know things like arthritis tendonitis and pain in the neck the back the i got a little bit of that i got a little bit of that going on yeah man so i wanted to ask you in that context what advice do you have for people like that that want to learn they're not all men mostly men. we get a fair bit of women and we get a few younger people too but mostly it's it's the, the you know the group that i described what advice do you have for somebody like that who wants to learn bass well I, first of all i would say it's never too late to start right it's on. never too late to start playing bass never too late it's just like anything else. It's never too late for it. Um, I find that it's, it, it's good to get a teacher, you know, get a teacher. Uh, if you're just starting out, get a teacher who knows to show you how to hold your hand. Um, I always encourage students who are beginners and even students who've been playing bass for a while. And some of these students could play bass better than I can. I got to be honest. I tell them, go for economy of motion, figure out Figure out a pet, you know, if you're going to play something on a bass, figure out a way to play it so you don't have to move your hand around and be uncomfortable. Be, get, you know, comfort is, it's all about comfort. You know, what is comfortable? If, if you, if you want to stretch out like Hadrian Ferro, that's fine. If you need to try to do that, that's fine. But there's a, there's a way of getting around a scale. There's a way of getting around a pattern where your hand can remain comfortable. Uh, there are fingering options, especially on the electric bass. There are fingering options that can you can afford the best economy of motion once you know what the pattern is or the line or the the etude that you're playing find the most efficient way to play it with your left hand with your right hand and i have some systems that i show students when they're learning how to play certain scales uh, it's not that complicated but it takes time and it takes dedication and i spend a lot of time with I spend a lot of time with students. I spend a lot of time with myself going back to something, a Charlie Parker head, whatever, and figuring out this is a better way to play this. And I talked with the, I talked with Ron Carter about this too. He's still figuring out how to play scales on the bass. And he's all into economy of motion too. He's a big economy. You know, he can play, you ever seen him play a B fat scale, scale not even moving his hand? You know, he can do that kind of stuff because he worked on it and he figured it out. And here's a guy who's 85 years old who still plays the bass like, He's 19. And a lot of that has to do with finding the most efficient system for playing scales, for playing patterns, you know, and a lot of those things are going to be things that you're going to come up with yourself. But I do have to go back to what I said before initially about if you're going to learn how to play the bass, go get a teacher, period. Get a teacher. There's so many of them out there. Go on bass players only. Figure, you know, get some of the elementary lessons. And, and, and adhere to it because you're not going to be able to figure it out by yourself. You're not going to get past a certain point with it unless you have a teacher who's going to tell you that's good. Try that. Go that path. 
don't do that. That's not going to work. You have to have somebody doing that for you all the time. I always, I'm still looking for teachers. I'm always, I'm picking brains. I'm picking everybody's brains. I'm picking my students' brains. That's one of the best things about teaching. One of the best things about teaching is you get to learn because some of these, some of these kids come up with, 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 with artists that I don't know who they are. You know, I don't know who they are because I'm, you know, I'm an old goat, you know, and I'm not, I'm not in it, you know, I'm not in it like I, you know, I don't want to say, you know, I mean, you, you, you got to look behind you and ahead of you. Thank you for the shout out for bass players only. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're on the mission. You're, you're on the path. The record yeah. is called The Art of the Bass Choir, Lincoln Goins. Ah, oh, shucks. <laughs> and, uh, well, it's got, the, the, the origin records did a nice, like, six-panel thing. You know, there's all the details of the information, who mixed what, who plays on what, very specific information. I was very, uh, I took my time trying to get all the right information. There's another picture of me on there uh, with a little introduction that I did just talking about the story of how this thing got put together a lot of things that i said to you initially in the, in the front of this interview are here about the inspiration for it uh and me being possessed by the spirit of the bass from a very early age and yes. um and always wanting to do a bass choir thing especially with with my contemporaries john patitucci and mike and tom kennedy and victor wooten these guys were all dying to be on this record they were they they couldn't they couldn't wait to contribute they thought it was an awesome idea and they jumped on it i the, the, i asked victor to play on this tune spank lee which is i think the third oh it's the second track on the record and i said victor can you put some uh i, I left some space for you here to put a some solo vocabulary here in the beginning and, and the thing at the end he sent me back eight tracks he turned it into a symphony you know, and I thought he was just going to do like a little weekend thing. He spent two weeks on it, and he can't. And he said, "I said, Victor, what? You, what? You, my God! You know, it was like awesome." And he was, you could tell he just had a ball doing it. I mean, he just had absolute ball doing this. It's great. I love the finished product, and I like what you said about who played on what and which tune, because that would mean a lot to me. I remember when I was a kid looking at the back of an LP, I had to know. Who played on every track? Who, where was it recorded? Who's the producer? Who was the, the engineer? Yeah, all the details are there. And there is, and I, I just want to make an announcement. Probably sometime next year, I'm going to be putting out a book uh, of the the charts for, for this music, and art of the bass choir songbook, um, that I'm going to be putting together in collaboration with Klaus Mueller uh, of the charts. So these, you know, if, if someone is so inclined to get together a bass ensemble wherever they are they can have the opportunity to play these these are not elementary pieces they're things that are probably obviously going to take some work and you're going to have to have extended range instruments and but there's the resource there's the record you can hear how it's supposed how it's supposed to sound and then the charts are going to be there that's Ooh. actually one of the things i'm going to be working on probably before i do another record <laughs> is do an so art of the bass choir songbook yeah, that would be very special. Congratulations again. The Art of the Bass Choir, Lincoln Goins, released date October 21st, 2022, which means it's already out and you can get it. And I hope you do. I've listened to it. I like it. I recommend it. And I think you'll like it too if you like bass, if you like really good bass playing by really great bass players. Thank you, John. Lincoln Goins, thank you very much. You're watching for bassplayersonly.com, where all the old rockers come to learn. <laughs> How to groove. And a lot of those old rockers are jazz fans too. So we're all in good. I'm company. an old rocker myself. Well, you fit right in. Glad to have you. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. Thanks for watching for bassplayersonly.com. We'll see you all next week. In the meantime, let's play bass.